Hey everyone, happy Easter. I hope you've not filled yourself up on too many hot cross buns. How good are they with some lovely hot butter on? And of course, Easter eggs. Hope you're not feeling too sick after consuming all those goodies. My name is Mark Greenwood and we have got a great programme lined up for you today. In just a few moments, we're going to kick straight in. Let me tell you what's going to happen. We've got a couple of singers, one of whom leads singing at a very well-known church in the UK. Another one is a very dear friend of mine who travels around. She's an amazing singer-songwriter. She's going to be leading us in a song. We've got one of the most famous singer-songwriters in Christianity across the world who's been around for so long, both helping churches to sing and using music to communicate to people about how amazing God is. He's called Graham Kendrick and he's got a performance piece for us today. And then Bear Grylls, who models himself on, yeah, you don't believe that, but Bear Grylls, who's pretty well known at doing some pretty outrageous things. He's going to be coming just sharing a bit of a reflection, a few thoughts for us today and then my very dear friend who is probably one of the best communicators of the Christian message in the world in my humble opinion uh, a guy by the name of J. John will come and speak to us and help us to understand uh, and to be able to experience and receive what the message of Easter is really all about so sit back and if you're watching this today and are somebody who uh, is a Christian, that is somebody who said yes to living life God's way and embrace his forgiveness. If that's you, you can join in with some of the songs that you'll know. But if you're here today uh, and maybe not a Jesus follower, so you're not familiar with these songs, by all means, feel free to join in. Uh, but feel free also just to listen and engage and let us know how we can help you in the journey of faith this Easter. God bless. That saved a wretch like me
a message for Easter. All of us struggle, but we don't have to struggle on our own. We have a never ending source of support and energy that can work so powerfully within us. All we need to do is depend on God's help and power for each and every task we face. That's why I try and start every day the same way. On my knees, quietly, reminding myself that I desperately need the presence of Christ with me. I ask for his forgiveness, uh, his confidence, for his strength. I ask him to protect my family, to guard my words, my, my attitudes and my actions. I ask him to take away my many fears and to give me his peace and to be with all those who are struggling. And God will never let us down. He's always there. Nothing is too impossible for him. There's nothing he can't help us through. No cave too dark or no mountain too steep. He's Lord of it all. As Jesus said, be sure of this, that I am with you, even to the ends of the earth. And this is the way of Christ. He draws us to our knees so he can draw us closer to him. He blesses us so that we can bless others. So let's together this Easter day be his ambassadors on earth. And that's our calling. Love, love, love. What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand
have placed all my hope in a crucified man and the wounds in his side, his feet and his hands. I have traded my pride for a share in his shame and the glory that one day will burst from his pain. I've abandoned my trust in the wise and the proud For this fragile, mysterious weakness of God And I dare to believe in his scandalous claim That his blood cleanses sin for whoever will call on his name Live or die, here I stand I've placed my hope in a crucified man I believe as they beat on his beautiful face He turned a torturous chair to an altar of grace Where the worst we can do at the best that God does where unspeakable hate met the gaze of unstoppable love At the crux of it all where he hangs I've placed my hope in a crucified man of sorrows Man of The purest and best took the force of our curse. Death's victory, our martyr, juddered into reverse. And either we bow or we stumble and fall. For the wisdom of a suffering God has made fools of us all. I gladly admit that I am. Crucified man of sorrows, man of grief, will he stay beyond belief? I've buried my life in the cold earth with him. Like a seed in the winter, I'll wait for the spring. From that garden of tombs, Eden rises again, and paradise blooms from his body and never will end. He'll finish all he began. Crucify man. When I stand at the judgment, I have no other plan. I've placed my hope in a crucified man. Like the thief nailed beside him, I have no other plan. Happy Easter to all of you. Why Easter? What a good question. And that's what we're going to look at now. Most heroes wear a cape. My hero wore a cross. Jesus didn't come 
for an excursion, but he came for an execution. I know I'm not perfect, but Jesus thinks I am to die for. Jesus Christ is my hero. Jesus made some astonishing claims about himself. So, for example, he said, I am the true vine. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. How do we know those statements are true? There is the famous story of Mallory and Irvin who tried to climb the summit of Everest in 1924. They got very close to the summit but never made it back. Irvin's body was found in 1999. Precisely because they didn't return, no one knows whether they were actually the first people to climb the world's highest mountain. We know Jesus' statements are true because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The Bible teaches Christ, who was dead, is alive, not a Christ who was alive and is dead. In the Bible, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 3, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Why? Would the apostles lie? Liars always lie for selfish reasons. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get out of it? What they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture and martyrdom hardly a list of perks. Jesus' resurrection authenticates everything he said and everything he did. In the 18th century, there was a man called Gilbert West and he was having a conversation with a number of friends discussing Christianity. And Gilbert West said, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to attack Christianity and I'm going to disprove Christianity and I'm going to write a book disproving that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He took this very seriously and began researching and began writing his book. But what happened? In the process of writing his book, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ and he wrote his book, The Other Way Around. I've got one of the original copies. Here's his book, 
written in the 18th century. Proof that Jesus Christ is alive. In the 19th century, a man called Lou Wallace, who was a general in the American army, was asked by a friend of his, who was an atheist, whether he would, because of his high profile, whether he would write a book against Christianity, or write a book to disprove the resurrection. And so he too began to research and began to write his book. But by the time he got to chapter four, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And then he wrote his book the other way round. His book is called Ben-Hur. You may have seen the film. In the 20th century, a lawyer and a journalist called Frank Morrison, he decided that he would disprove Christianity and the only way you can do that is to disprove the resurrection. He was a lawyer, he was a journalist, he, he knew how to find what he needed for, to argue his case, but, and he knew how to play around with the material. But in the process of writing his book, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And Frank Morrison wrote his book, The Other Way Round. It's called Who Moved the Stone? Many people who've endeavoured to explore whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead have discovered that he is alive. If Jesus rose from the dead, then we have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not we like his teaching, but whether or not Jesus rose from the dead and therefore he is the truth and his teaching is true. Christianity is not true because it works. It works because it is true. The resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone to a worldview that provides the perspective to all of life. Jesus' resurrection makes it possible for us, for you, for me, to move towards the light and the love of God. I like what C.S. Lewis a professor at Oxford who was once an atheist, but then encountered the crucified risen Jesus, wrote this. I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun has risen. Not because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. To understand the implication of Easter Day, we need to understand Good Friday. Easter reminds us of the problem of humanity, that we need rescuing. Easter reminds us that for all of our technological triumphs, for all our intellectual successes, we, are moral failures and we need rescuing. The Bible records in 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for 
everyone. You see, you and I, we are all battling with a virus called COVID-19. But we are all battling with another. It's called sin. And we need to understand what that little word means. It basically means failing to do what God has commanded us to do and doing what has been forbidden for us to do. All of us have done that. You see, before we can see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. St Paul in the Bible says, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. All the the sin that we've done, all the wrong that we've done, it works a bit like an overdraft in a bank account. And if you have an overdraft and I have an overdraft, you can't help me, I can't help you. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world to die on a cross, because by dying on a cross, It was as if he was cashing a cheque, signed with his own blood, to say, here's the cheque, to clear your overdraft so that you could be forgiven. The great artist Rembrandt, a Christian who had a deep awareness of his own failings, painted a fascinating crucifixion scene called the raising of the cross in 1633. It has a typically dark background with the light falling on two central figures. One is Jesus nailed to the cross. The other is a man who is identifiable as Rembrandt himself. It was his way of saying, I did this. I am a participant in Christ's death. And that is true for you and for me. It was because of our sin that disconnected us from God, that Jesus came to die to forgive and reconcile us. If the cross was just the death of Jesus, it would be the bleakest image in history. It is not Bad Friday, but Good Friday. Christians use the cross as a symbol not because it commemorates tragedy, but because it commemorates triumph. Jesus died with us and he died for us. The Easter story is of a God who gets involved with us. It's very common to imagine God as remote and distanced, like a satellite in the sky, distantly observing us without concern. But Easter tells us that God gets alongside us. He becomes one of us, even in the worst possible situation. At the horrifying sight of the cross, with all its terrible suffering, God is 
there. A father and his young son were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring day. Suddenly, a bumblebee flew in the car window. Since the little boy was allergic to bee stings, he became petrified. His father quickly reached out, grabbed the bee and squeezed it in his hand and then released it. But as soon as he let it go, his son became frantic once again as it buzzed around the car. The father saw his son's fear once again. He reached out his hand, but this time he pointed to his hand. There, stuck in his hand, was the sting of the bee. You see this, he asked. You don't need to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. You and I, we do not need to be afraid of death because Christ has taken the sting out of death and sin. One of my favourite stories is the one of the famous artist who went back to the very small rural community where he was born and brought up. And he's just walking around some of the village stores, sees an antique shop, looks in the window, cannot believe what he sees. He sees one of his paintings. It was one that he'd painted years before he was famous. The frame was broken. The picture was dirty. The picture was scratched. It was his. But he couldn't go into the antique shop and say, that's my painting, give it back to me. If he wanted it back, he had to buy it back before he could clean it, restore it and reframe it. That is exactly what God did in Jesus. He bought us back to clean us, to restore us and to reframe us. Jesus came to pay a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. It was love, not nails, that kept Jesus on the cross. Christ's crucifixion as the Son of God allowed our adoption as children of God. Christ went to a place of separation so that we might never need to be separated from God. Christ became empty so that we might become filled. Christ became nothing so that we can become something. That is what the cross is about. Our old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. We have a great need for Christ and we have a great Christ for our need. The cross is the only door that opens to heaven. The cross is the only passage into God's presence. Why Easter? Without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would be no hope in this world. Christ's resurrection is the source of hope. Without Christ, we have 
a hopeless end. But with Christ, we have an endless hope. Christian hope is a certainty guaranteed by God himself. No matter how devastating our struggles, our disappointments, our troubles are, they are only temporary. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain you face, no matter how death stalks you and your loved ones, Easter promises you and me a future of immeasurable good. Easter gives your life and my life meaning. Easter gives your life and my life direction. Easter gives your life and my life the opportunity to start over no matter what our circumstances. Easter is summed up in this one Bible verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is offering us through Jesus Christ forgiveness from the past, new life here today and a hope for the future. We're all being given an invitation this Easter week by Jesus Christ. Have you accepted your invitation. I accepted my invitation on the 9th of February 1975 when I was a student in London. My friend Andy showed me in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, where it says Jesus stands at the door of a house knocking and if you hear the knock, open the door and let Jesus in. And I remember my friend Andy said to me, have you heard Jesus knocking on your door? And I said, I think so. He says, have you opened the door? I said, well, I don't know where the door is. He said, don't worry about that. Ask Jesus to break the door down. And so I did. I knelt beside my bed on the 9th of February, 1975, the first time I can ever remember me kneeling or praying. And I prayed. I prayed that Jesus would break the door down. I prayed that I would experience his death and resurrection in my life. I prayed that I would experience forgiveness, new life and a hope. And I did. And I'm more convinced than I've ever been all these years later because I know him. I know the crucified, resurrected Jesus who has set me free. If you want to open the door of your life this Easter time, then wherever you are, wherever you're listening, wherever you're tuned in, whether you're sitting or standing or kneeling, pray these words with me now. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, that you are alive today. 
I come to you just as I am. I know I have done many things wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse my life. Set me free from the past. I invite you now into my life. Come in by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your peace, your presence and your power. Thank you that I can have forgiveness from the past, that I can have new life today and I can have a hope for the future. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for answering my prayer. Amen. A prayer for you. I pray for everyone that echoed or prayed that prayer. I pray that they would know the truth and the reality of the prayer that was prayed. I pray that you would experience cleansing and forgiveness. I pray that you will be filled with the presence of his Holy Spirit. I pray that you would know well-being in body, mind and spirit, and you would know his protection. And I pray God's blessing upon you, the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you did pray that prayer, wonderful. And it's the beginning of a new day, of a new season in your life. And whether you prayed the prayer for the first time or you prayed it as a way of reaffirming your faith, can I encourage you to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the New Testament of the Bible and, and read the teaching of Jesus and read about the life of Jesus uh, and allow his words to guide you in your next steps. Happy Easter. Once again, it's been such a delight to be able to share together as a church this morning. And uh, we know uh, that taking what God has been doing in our lives, we can go and have wonderful weeks with him. Just to um, invite you um, to journey together with one another as we go through the week. We as a church, we don't just gather, but we get going into what God has for us together. And we have these things called transform communities. We would love to help you to connect with other like-minded people who are exploring God's goodness and grace and seeing how they can be a part of his transforming work in the world. So again, hit us up, get in touch. We'd love to help you to connect. Anything that you need, any prayer requests, do let us know. And we'll love to see you again this time next week. God bless you and bye for now.